Good afternoon, or good morning, good evening, wherever you are. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this very important session to discuss women's health. Uh, my name is Shyam Bishen, and I head up the Center for Health and Healthcare at the World Economic Forum. It's my great pleasure to welcome Your Excellency, Minister Smriti Irani, esteemed speakers, as well as all distinguished guests here. We all know gender health gap affects everyone. It affects our families, our communities, our workplace, our societies. It has been mentioned that there are many implications for gender health gap. For example, a woman will spend an average of nine years in poor health, affecting her abilities to work at home and in the community. Uh, we just uh, launched a report earlier today together with our knowledge partner, McKinsey. It's called Closing the Women's Health Gap that we published this morning. It shows that not only we are able to avoid 75 million years of life loss due to poor health or early death per year, but also we can significantly boost global economy. The report finds that closing the gender health gap would enable women to participate more actively in the workforce, uh, and this can lead to 1.7% increase in GDP. We are calling it a trillion dollar opportunity. We close the women's health gap, we are calling it a trillion dollar opportunity. So this is huge. Today, uh, we also launched our Global Alliance uh, for Women's Health, uh, together with the, some of the board members here. Uh, it's a collaboration with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We had our first board meeting uh, today, co-chaired by uh, Her Excellency uh, Nisia Trinidad Lima, the Health Minister of Brazil, and uh, Dr. Anita Jedi, uh, President of Gender uh, Parity at Will and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have other board members that are present here. Um, we have uh, Faring, CEO. Uh, we also had the Managing Board Director from uh, Siemens. Uh, we have a few other board members, the Executive Director of UNICEF, uh, President of National Academy of Medicine, Health Minister or Secretary uh, from Kenya, Finance Minister of Morocco. Uh, so these were other board members uh, that participated in the discussion. Now, without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, hand it over to our uh, great moderator, uh, Gina Sufan, senior anchor from Ashraq uh, News, who will moderate our discussion and properly introduce each panel uh, speaker here. So over to you, uh, Gina. Thank you so much, uh, Shiam, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed uh, panelists, distinguished guests, and dear audience watching us live on Ashark News Television and digital platforms. Welcome to a pivotal discussion on an issue that lies at the heart of our shared future, closing the gender gap in health. Today, we stand on the cusp of making history as we launch the Global Alliance for Women's Health and the groundbreaking Women's Health Investment Case here at the World Economic Forum. Imagine a world where investing in women's health fosters a windfall for global economies boosting them by an astounding $1 trillion, just as Shyam just said, annually, a 1.7% increase in per capita GDP that fosters societies where everyone thrives. For too long, the profound disparities in women's health have cast long shadows over our progress, underscoring a dire need for change. Females form the bedrock of robust families, dynamic communities, and flourishing economies. They often bear the brunt of a legacy marred by gender bias from the persistence of the male default in medical research to systemic underfunding of women's health. Yet within these challenges lies an unprecedented opportunity, the chance to infuse economies with vigor simply by harnessing the untapped potential of female health. The equation is simple yet powerful. For every dollar invested in women's health, Threefold returns in economic growth await. It's an investment that transcends monetary value, unlocking cycles of prosperity that resonate through every layer of society, from education of our young girls to the leadership of women to the highest echelons of power. The statistics are more than numbers. They are cl a clarion call for urgent action. Women outliving men 
but spending 25% of that time in poor health, common drugs resulting in adverse side effects due to miscalculated doses for women, and the hidden cost of untreated conditions like premenstrual syndrome, which are more prevalent than male-specific conditions, yet significantly under-researched. Our panel today is more than a discussion. It's a catalyst for real and measurable change. The Global Alliance for Women's Health embodies a mission to ignite investments, spur innovation, and shape agendas to bridge the health gap that women disproportionately bear. We are not just advocating for equality in health, we are strategizing for a future where every woman's well-being is a cornerstone of economic strength and societal well-being. Join us as we embark on this journey of transformation because when we invest in women's health, we invest in the wealth of the world. And I am extremely honored to be joined on this session by Her Excellency Smriti Zubin Irani, Minister of Women and Child Development of India, Anita Zaidi, who is the president of gender equality at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who co-chairs the Global Alliance for Women Health, Bernd Muntag, the chief executive officer at Siemens Healthineers, and Pierre Falk, the president of Faring Pharmaceuticals. And allow me to open the discussion with you, Anita. So why the alliance now? Why the alliance first? Why the alliance now? And why was it very important for you to frame the whole issue of women health care as a gender inequality issue? Yes, thank you for that. Um, um, and so what um, the opportunity in front of us is actually laid out uh, very clearly in this report, where women's health has been a long underinvested, neglected area in global health but actually overall in all of the investments that we make. And there's so much that we can do and so much potential that there is uh, to make rapid advances in this field that we felt that the moment uh, is right to bring together a multi-stakeholder platform to bring attention to this issue, to increase investments in women's R&D. There are so many uh, health problems that women have that have been very uh, long understudied, under-researched, uh, lack of data so that we address, address the uh, lack of uh, research uh, and science, science and innovation in women's health, that we bring attention to the poor health care that women get, mm -hmm. and, and how do we change that? Uh, and we also uh, pay attention to the lack of data that exists about women's health. And now, the, of course, the, the added benefit, and we are at the World Economic Forum, is the tremendous economic return that investing in women's health can, can make. And that's what this report has uh, outlined, and I encourage all of you to read it. Further, we know now that there are actually tools that already exist and innovations that already exist that if we use them widely, they would make a huge difference in women's and girls' lives around the world, and they would make a huge difference in the economies. One example is the HPV vaccine that we can come back to. We, we can come back to that. Program. I'd like to uh, move to Your Excellency. Do you think that we've been looking at women health care for too long from very narrow perspectives and missing out on sort of linking the dots? I mean, what can you tell us after uh, long years of experimenting with very remarkable initiatives in India when it comes to uh, women health care? I think women healthcare systems or conversations never were mainstreamed. Mm. And that has been one of the greatest challenges. How do you provide solution to an issue which is never spoken of? Yeah. Mostly, there is a presumption that women do not want the psychological burden of their own medical challenge to fall upon their family unit or hinder the economic progression uh, of their contribution and that is why they tend to either self-medicate or not medicate at all. Mm -hmm. From the Indian experience, let me provide you a big context. Uh, Post-2014, when Prime Minister Modi took office. In the year 2010-11, there was a World Bank report which said that if there is a lack of sanitation facilities for women, there is a negative 6% burden on the GDP of India. Mm -hmm. That being said, there was also the issue of security of women who were violated if they decided to defecate in the open. Mm. Now, this information being available was politically and administratively acted upon by Prime Minister Modi, who first said that if you want to ensure the health and dignity of women, let's start building toilets. Now, Sufan, from a cultural context, mm. building toilets has never been politically glamorous. 
But Prime Minister Modi did that. And we built under his leadership 110 million individual toilets, which means it was an added impetus given to a woman's menstrual health as well. Under Prime Minister Modi, for the first time in the history of our country, we had an administrative protocol set up for menstrual hygiene management by governments at the center, state, including administration at the district or the grassroots village, which means that the narrative about women's health was mainstreamed politically and administratively. Then Prime Minister Modi said, let's look at the issue of access to safe cooking fuel. A mm. hundred million poor women given cooking fuel clean, subsidized directly mm. by Prime Minister Modi. We saved because uh, there has been a WHO report which said we saved 400,000 lives per year of women only by providing access to clean cooking fuel. Mm. Then there was the water promise. 130 million individual portable water connections given mm -hmm. to poor families, women who spend half a day either collecting firewood or collecting water for their domestic consumption, lessening their burden. And then came a program called the Ayushman Bharat, which is the world's largest healthcare system. Let me come back to this program when we <laughs> talk about access, Your Excellency. I want to move to Bernd here and ask, why are you joining the alliance? So um, we are, as um, this is Ms. Healthy Mir, so there's a little bit of a commercial break now. We are, I, <laughs> even if it doesn't sound like it, we are a young company, yeah, so we, did, uh, we, we are a public company since six years. But, what we really want to achieve is the transition from a technology company, which is respected for the great equipment, mm -hmm. to something bigger. Yeah, and we gave ourselves a purpose. Um, we pioneer breakthroughs in healthcare for everyone, everywhere, sustainably. And this is not a Slow. Uh, tagline. This is something which is a real um, um, responsibility, yeah, where we measure ourselves and we really say, what is the impact? Uh, for 8 billion people, mm. and about half of these people are women, yeah? mm. um, and we need to be serious about it. And um, that is why we join, and that is why um, I think it is impossible in the long run yeah, that women typically take care of the health matters of the families. The majority of nurses is female. Um, in Germany, the majority of medical students is female, and uh, since this year, the majority of medical doctors is already female. Yeah, but there is this huge gap, and whatever we can do to contribute, uh, we want to do. Per, why are you joining? And do you think the alliance comes at a critical time, perhaps not only for women, but? for humankind? I think it's for everyone. We yeah. should, uh, and I think that's one thing that is very important. We should stop looking at this as, shall we say, solving an issue for women. Yeah. We're actually not. We're solving in which, uh, an issue for the population of the world. Right? Because, and the report clearly shows that, that you know, beside the inequity and obvious unfairness, which of course is very authoritatively described in the report, we should remember that reports like that have been generated with regularity for decades and led to nothing. Uh, we know this very well because uh, we are a solution provider within reproductive medicine and maternal health. So we've been in maternal health for five decades and we have seen that no matter the best efforts and how well we try, there is no traction or interest uh, from payers uh, or, or from science in this area. So I think it is at a critical time. I think it's overdue, so let's make it happen now. Uh, we are so happy to be here, and I think the, the composition of the Alliance Board as well as the people up here shows the complexity of the problem we're trying to solve. It's not only a problem of drugs or of infrastructure. It's a policy issue. It's, a, it's changing hearts and minds of policymakers and decision makers. And for that, you need this multilateral group of people who can provide different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's natural to be here. And we're really, really happy that we can join. I want to, ba to go back to you, Anita. So as uh, Per rightly said, we've had 
reports before. Mm -hmm. What's different this time? Mm -hmm. Do we have more of an opportunity map? Mm -hmm. And uh, what does uh, what does a report like the McKinsey report with all the figures in it bring to the discussion? Yeah, also great question. Um, uh, and uh, you know, so what? So Gates Foundation has been working on gender equality and on, on maternal health for a, for a very long time. Yes. Right? Uh, what's new is that three years ago, um, we we uh, made a new division called the Gender Equality Division, which is really looking at what are the, um, uh, we continue the, 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 the work that we've been doing, but we're looking at what are the, uh, where are we missing impact, right? And one of the areas that we identified where we, we thought that we were missing impact and we could do much more was women's health. And uh, I, we had the pleasure um, uh, and uh, privilege of organizing a convening with the NIH in the United States last year, um, where we brought together, um, NIH hosted this meeting, and we brought together 250 women and uh, other interested individuals from around the world, um, representing industry, uh, uh, academia, science, um, philanthropies, venture capital, um, regulatory, uh, patients, patient advocates, like people, women suffering from diseases that have no cures, uh, very little investment right now, to come together and uh, uh, in a meeting and then discuss what is it that we should be doing for women's health, right? And this group, these 250 women over the next year worked to produce a report called the, called the Opportunity Map. Uh, for women's health R&D, for women's health innovation, which has eight areas of work that if we fund, it would solve so many of the health issues that we see among women. Um, and 50 very specific opportunities that, could, uh, that, uh, the, uh, we, that we should all address by investing more in science and innovation, as well as in better health delivery and better uh, gender specific and ethnic uh, data, because a lot of the burden is right now hidden and it doesn't, it, it does not get attention because nobody's measuring, right? Because measurement is undervalued. Your Excellency, I want to go to the Ayushman Bharat uh, program that you have in India. You had just started uh, speaking about it. So it touches the, the, the lives of 100 million families in India. You can tell us more about it. But what I am really interested in knowing is after over five years of working on that program, what can you tell us about your observations of the outcomes of giving women access? access to healthcare. So I think first, before I mm. just address the issue on hand, I would like to reflect a little bit on what Pear said. All reports are not useless. Uh, in fact, the one that Sham comes up with gives not only a cause for action, but also a cause for reflection. Mm. For instance, when I talk about Prime Minister Modi looking at what has been said before by experts mm. on issues of uh, women's health, he did it at various levels, and I've described some of it. There were also reports, and a plenty of them, which spoke about access to health care and making it affordable. Mm -hmm. And looking at that challenge, which had been documented in many uh, such agencies and many such possible organizational outputs, uh, Aishman Bharat today serves 440 million Indians mm -hmm. across 27,000 hospitals for over 1,900 diseases. The hospital admissions only under that program now stands at a count of 62 million. Apart from that, the Prime Minister also dedicated his efforts towards preventive health care. So they are close to over 120,000 health and wellness centers that are operational there. When you look at opportunities in women's health, it does not only subscribe itself to access to healthcare institutions is also an economic opportunity for women to come up and become a part of the healthcare workforce. Mm -hmm. The pandemic showed that six million women turned up at the front line of delivering vaccine and pharmaceutical support to all Indian families. We did it digitally. Also today in the health and wellness centers that are operational in India, 130,000 healthcare workers, 66% of them are women. But there are segments of healthcare vis-a-vis -vis gender which need direct focus on. Anita spoke about this opportunity, uh, segregated eight such segments. And when 
as a woman, I hear talk about, oh, healthcare is to be for everybody. I agree. But far too long have we said healthcare is for everybody, hence everybody will get addressed. But there are issues which are culturally contextualized to some parts of the globe where certain aspects of women's health do not get a public exposure. For instance, Aishman Bharat Yojana ended up helping 270 million Indian women get screened for cancer of the breast mm -hmm. and the cervix. Now, there was a presumption, let's say, in the global north that cancer of the cervix is a culturally taboo issue, will never be spoken about, and no government will address it. What this success or these numbers tell us is that all women needed was access mm -hmm. and affordable care. Mm -hmm. Another issue, which is not gendered, but gives you cause for possible reflection, 360 million oral cancer screenings, men, women, everybody alike. Mm -hmm. Now, these are data sets on which governments like ours are ensuring the privacy of the patient at hand, are also ensuring that we have this whole ecosystem where we have over 600,000 data sets which are now available for investors and medical institutions to build on and service the medical community and women at large better. My work, let's say, in the Ministry of Women and Child Development, we have created something called the Potion Tracker, which is a digital platform where 2.2 million women feed data from 1.4 million nutrition centers. It covers 100 million beneficiaries. 25 million are women who are pregnant and lactating. 75 million are kids under the age of six. We track them monthly, and Sufan, you'd be shocked that WHO standards of measuring nutrition mostly has smaller sample sizes yeah. of families that are measured. We measured 75 million children every month as per WHO standards. We made that data digitally available to local governments, but also at the center, we red flag each and every child who possibly has had their nutritional status challenge Till such time, if one child is found to be severely, acutely malnourished, the medical officer lands up at the door, mm. along with weight support for the mother so that we can give them institutional care till such time the child is completely healed. We will come back to data, <laughs> and specifically with women's health care. Uh, Bernd, I want to go to you, back to access, and uh, which you have identified as a strategic growth uh, vector. I want to ask where uh, you see the opportunity, and if you can illustrate through some examples. Yeah, I mean, uh, a little bit where we come from, yeah? and, and, and I say it, uh, don't, I don't want to be too negative. Yeah? I mean, typically we come from an environment where our business is to cater even better technologies to those who already have it. Yeah? And we are working with the leading institutions, they are our innovation partners, and we can rely on the ec ecosystem existing. Yeah? So there is the MD Anderson Cancer Center, and they need a better CT scanner, Linux, and whatever, and then here we are, and we are proud. Yeah? So that is a little bit of a caricature. Yeah? So, um, but in this transition to really be about for everyone, everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have clearly understood we cannot wait for the ecosystem to call us. Yeah? We need sure. to help building the, the ecosystem. We have to transcend our normal way of looking at ourselves and we need to go into new types of partnerships. And we need to be inspired not by those, not only by those who have it all, but by those who don't have it. Yeah, so and that this is an as proud source of innovation as the next level of, of whatever cancer care image quality or whatever what it is. Yeah, so this is the transition. For that, we work, we build partnerships with NGOs, with governments, but also with healthcare providers who have the same target yeah, to to um, solve the access to care issues, whether it is in the US even, yeah, where there is a big difference in, in coverage, yeah, depending on where in the city you live, mm -hmm. um, to emerging countries. Yeah? And one of the topics is similar to what you mentioned, um, high focus on bringing uh, breast cancer sc uh, screening to underprivileged communities 
yeah, with mobile deployments mm. as one of the examples, yeah, whether it's in the US or in India. Yeah? Let me pick on some of what Bernd said and uh, come to you, for, because he said the word innovation and he said access. And you have solved a problem of access through innovation when you came up with a, a drug that resists uh, a sensitivity of oxytocin, I hope I'm saying it correctly, to heat. Mm -hmm. And oxytocin is really needed for women who uh, get bleeding after they give a birth. Um, how did this invention uh, come about? Okay, yeah. how did you come with it? And how many lives is it saving? Uh, well, let's start about what happened and how we, uh, this, and again, we could never have done this ourselves. Uh, Bernd's point is, is uh, very valid here. We, this is thanks to a very constructive uh, public-private partnership, starting with the, the WHO and uh, MSD from others. So in 2013, the WHO recognizing the heat and climate sensitivity of oxytocin, which actually puts women at risk because when you have a profuse bleeding, you don't have much time to stop it. So if you start using a, a drug which may not be fully potent, mm. you increase the risk of, of a fatality mm. uh, significantly. So there was a request for proposal for a uh, uterotonic, whatever it looked like, that could withstand temperature and therefore did not require refrigeration in transport or in storage. Uh, and and Ferring had then worked with oxytocin and oxytocin-like molecules for a very long time and, and simply engineering-wise, if I allow myself to be a little technical, by ex exchanging one out of nine amino acids to an unnatural amino acid, uh, this molecule became heat-stable. And uh, so when the request for proposal came, we had a solution. Uh, and we started this public-private partnership in 2013. Now, it's now at, on its 11th year. It's moving into its second wave of clinical trials and validation because it's not like we have a molecule. We give it to the WHO and they go out and try it. We, we went together through a 30,000 trial, 30,000 women in a prospective controlled clinical trial to validate the safety and efficacy of the product we got it approved in Swiss Medic uh, first. Now we have uh, a commitment to the partnership that we will ensure regulatory mm -hmm. approval in all low and low middle income countries in the world, which is close to 90, and most of them probably countries where we usually do not operate or do business. And we're also responsible to, to train healthcare providers to do this properly. So uh, for us, this has been, uh, I would say, a transforming moment because it sort of puts us on the global health care map as an important contributor to a global ecosystem. Right? And, and I would just end by saying these partnerships are not necessarily easy. Mm. I think there have been many times when the people around the table, and I can attest to that, have sort of wondered why we're actually here because we do th see things different. But I'll come back to you with public-private partnerships, yeah. but I want to go to Anita here and ask her, um, you've been through, uh, from your experience, long years of different kinds of collaborations. What can you tell us about the type of collaborations that can really push innovation? Yeah, so I'd say three things, uh, Zena. One is, um, uh, bring people from different types of backgrounds together. You know, people who are like improbable partnerships, people who've not had in a chance to be in the room together. And in fact, the Innovation Equity Forum that I just talked to you about, those 250 yes. women, literally many of them were crying mm. because they said they had never been in a room together talking to a venture capitalist or talking to industry uh, or talking to scientific uh, yeah. experts in, in a disease that they, they, they suffered, right? And so just the creating the convening and the opportunity for improbable partnerships, improbable people who have an interest in the area, mm -hmm. right, to come together. That's something that uh, um, we have to do better, and I think it's a real opportunity for women's health area. Mm -hmm. I've had the, the privilege of doing it in other parts, like typhoid uh, was like that. The, you know, we didn't have a solution for typhoid, and yet we knew that there was a solution possible. You just had to bring all of the different people together to make it happen, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The other thing is like, the commitment, right? People who are really committed, who are not just like talking heads, <laughs> like yes. they really want to get stuff done. Yeah. So if you can do those two things, diverse group of individuals, mm -hmm. 
and committed individuals, you can really make things happen. That's my experience. Your Excellency, I heard you once say that there's a confidence gap between that needs to be bridged to move from failure to success. Can you tell me what you mean, what you really meant by that when it comes to women healthcare? Well, I'd said this back home that women have no problems speaking up. Mm. The problem is how much are they heard? Mm -hmm. And I think that articulates the gap. It is not as if the challenge or the opportunity or the capacity to address the challenge did not exist. As Anita says, there's a need to get convergence. Mm -hmm. There's a need to get money on the table to supplement the cause. Mm -hmm. There was also a need to have policymakers come to the table and collaborate better. There are parts of the world, Zena, where public-private partnerships become untouchable in many arenas of engagement. Mm -hmm. The health sector is one such area where public-private partnerships have done well, both for the private sector mm -hmm. and for citizens at large. Mm -hmm. And I think women's health is one such arena in which much is to be done, mm -hmm. but it can only be done if the public-private partnership and the development sector can spearhead it. Mm. I think that's where the solution lies. Mm. So for me, as far as health and women goes, women never had a problem articulating the challenge. Mm. Who is hearing? Mm. Now there are many years, mm. and that's, I think, a cause for celebration. And this is where I come back to you, Per. We, we were just starting to tell us about what it felt like to sit with the stakeholders at the table the first time, each coming from a different world. What, what level of trust was there in the air? I think in, there was a long period of yeah. feeling each other out and trying to come to grips with what is our actual incentive for sitting at this table. And, and uh, I think the challenge with the, the public-private partnership runs around economy, of course, right? Where we have to respect how we sustain ourselves as organizations and to, to find a way to come over that, that step, right? That for me, as the president of a pharmaceutical company, no one gives me money. Mm -hmm. and, and I have responsibilities for sustaining mm -hmm. my organization of 8,000 people with salaries, their breadwinners, and with infrastructure that allows my organization to, to exist and grow and thrive, and for that, I will need the money that I, is left after I've sold something, pay taxes, do some fees, and then I can decide what to do. Uh, then there are other funding agencies that I can't use, but, but you know, we, we basically have to overcome that. And I think there was a lot of doubts in the beginning. There was a lot of, I wouldn't say conflict, I, I commend everyone who has been at this table, people who have come and gone, but what kept us together in the end and kept us at the table was that we're all here to solve a vital problem. Uh, 70,000 women die every year from profuse bleeding after delivery. Most of those deaths are clearly preventable and the, and the, the, the consequences of those deaths are of course a, a tragedy and unacceptable. It's a loss of life but it's a loss of so much more for the family that in the end we found a way and I think now after 11 years we are very comfortable in working with each other. <laughs> Uh, and finding good solutions. Bernd, I'll uh, go to you uh, with this. Uh, Mper just said, uh, basically, in one of his points, that philanthropy cannot solve alone mm. the women health care issue. You have to have real investments. Now, you, as Siemens Health Engineers, okay, you take equipment, state-of-the-art equipment, to underserved communities. You can't just leave them and go. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot to be done, capacity building, education, working with the local community. Walk me through the cycle and tell me when you think business kicks in. So in order to address this mm. challenge, yeah, we, we, um, we are as part of, of especially of this as access to care um, um, program, very actively partnering um, with on the one hand local governments, local providers um, and NGOs yeah, so that we build the infrastructure which is, which is critical and when we, and it, as you said, it only makes sense, it is only sustainable um, when it's a source of income. Yeah? We, we cannot, I mean as, as, as much it sounds more noble to donate, um, it's not sustainable. Yeah? So we need to find a way to do this. On the other hand, yeah, 
when looking at where we historically come from, yeah, we are not alone. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the the world didn't have computer tomography for, for, and, and MRI scanners for, forty years ago. So this, there was an effort to build the infrastructure so that this is replacing explorative surgery, yeah, which was standard of care back then. But it also didn't fall from the sky, so there was also some ecosystem building. And now, some maybe overly trivial examples. When you look at, and I'm, I don't know rural India as good as, as you do, yeah? but when you look at how much access to Coke, mm. Coca-Cola, Coca -Cola is in the world. <laughs> yeah? So I don't, I, I don't know the data, yeah? but when you compare access to Coke with access to care, it shows that Coca-Cola did a good job in, you know, they are not donating the soft drink, yeah? So it's possible, yeah, to, to, to build the chain. Yeah, it's a trivial example. I mean, you look at cell phone coverage in LMICs, it's pretty amazing. So, and what is now more important, yeah? Healthcare, the cell phone, or Coca-Cola, yeah? So I think we, we, we have the, um, we have some role models, yeah, to be careful, yeah? <laughs> But I would add to Please. that is that you have to price it right for the people so they can afford it, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you and many pharma companies don't don't do that, mm -hmm. and that then that becomes. But there are also system. some partnerships that, that can, can help, help in that yes. regard when you yes. guarantee volumes, correct? That, exactly, that's the public partner part, uh, public par private partnerships or philanthropy can come in and mm -hmm. see hey, how can we catalyze this market, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vaccines, the, uh, Gavi. This is a really good example of how we have made vaccines available to children everywhere around the world. And the f vaccines are made by pharma companies, uh, but we've been able to, you know, uh, make a market for vaccines in, in developing countries mm -hmm. so that everybody can get the vaccine by bringing the prices down. Yeah. And that opportunity is there for women's health, right? Mm -hmm. That opportunity is there for taking, mm -hmm. for all of us to act. Anita, also from your work, I mean, we're talking about mm -hmm. um, heavy interventions, big inventions, uh, capital-intensive mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. uh, are there sometimes small solutions to big problems? Absolutely. So just like we have vaccines, like very powerful public health tools, there are so many things that we can do which are very simple tools that can save millions of lives. So one example is, uh, is, po is, is postpartum hemorrhage that Per was talking about. Yeah. So the most common cause of uh, dying during childbirth is uh, bleeding uh, after delivery. And uh, uh, until very recently, the standard of care was that you would do, if a woman started bleeding after the baby was born, that you would do one thing and then another thing and then another thing. Uh, Gates, from the Gates Foundation, we funded a very large study mm -hmm. to show that if you actually, instead of doing one thing and then another thing and another, th another thing and wasting time, if you put it all together as a bundle and you deliver it together, you save so many women from developing severe postpartum hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. But there is an added uh, uh, benefit that came out of the study, which is just mind blowing which is that so far, there was not a good way of measuring how much blood women were actually losing, right? Mm -hmm. You just eyeball it and say, oh, well, this looks like too much blood to me, and so I should, I should, maybe I should do something. So the investigators, the people who did this study, had the brilliant idea that we should develop a standardized tool, which is basically a plastic drape that they put under a woman who's delivering, and it has a pocket at the end, which captures the blood that as it is coming out. And there's measurement uh, like you have in a cylinder or something or a, a cup, yeah, how many ml. So they, they realized that when they were measuring it, they were detecting much more women bleeding more than they thought by visual looking, right? They, yeah, so they could see, oh, oh, I should do something now because I can see the, that there's 300 ml or there's 500 ml. And when they started acting, you know, the number of postpartum hemorrhage cases that they were diagnosing went up from like 3%, 4% to 16%, 20%. Right, that type of number, such a simple tool. And so when they acted on that number, huge impact on the number of women developing severe postpartum hemorrhage. So what's the intervention here? It's a plastic sheet with measurement on it, right? Cents, not even a dollar, that we can get out to every woman out there. Yeah. I have a HPV sense. vaccine, can I just Jeez, say, because that's an amazing, amazing uh, uh, vaccine, prevents cervical cancer. Cervical cancer, 600,000 cases every year, 340,000 deaths every year. It takes women in the prime of their lives, mothers with young children, right? We, uh, the world had thought uh, that you need two or three doses to prevent uh, HPV infection, which is what leads to cervical cancer. 
now we know through actually data from India mm. <laughs> that if girls can get one dose of HPV vaccine, it protects them from cervical cancer. How much did we save? So yeah, so you save you save so much money. You save giving them three doses of vaccine. So now you can immunize so many more girls. You don't just have to immunize the nine to eleven year old girls. You can go up to age eighteen, age twenty, mm. and save so many girls from getting a, a disease which is lethal, right? Yes. So I mean, and so the cost saving is huge, right? And the opportunity to uh, have this simple tool, like it's a one and done, one and done for cervical cancer. That's where we are today. Yeah. We can do this. Mm. I was going to go back to your excellency with the HPV example, actually based on the, the Indian uh, data. Uh, what can you tell us about all these studies, all these findings, the, the McKinsey report findings today, and how they can help uh, health officials in pushing for more strategizing of preventive uh, health care for uh, women? I think that at the onset of the response, I would like to tell mm. the gentleman to my right that care is available Aren't. everywhere, not Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> what the Alliance can help do, mm. actually, is reflect on such reports mm. over the past, let's say, decade and a half. Mm. See what are the goals and the proposals that haven't been met thus far. Mm. If they can put and ascribe a geography to it, mm. I think that'll be helpful for thought leaders, mm. pharmaceutical companies, those who are manufacturing medical devices, mm -hmm. and also possibly give the Alliance, the Global Expanse, which is its ambition, mm -hmm. targeted benefits uh, that will come to gender and health. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Mm -hmm. I also believe that there is much data which is not available only with policymakers. Mm -hmm. but let's say Siemens and the medical instrumentation, which is available at their end, they have data from the entire globe and the health systems there, which without, I think, usurping any propriety rights, at least that data also can speak to such an alliance, mm -hmm. which will help inform policy better. Mm -hmm. And I believe, lastly, that um, many alliances, and the pessimists will say, are pronounced, but never are implemented in an accelerated fashion. So can we have at least 10 such agendas, mm -hmm. especially on deliverables, mm -hmm. not only in terms of research, because research is a very poignant journey, takes time, mm -hmm. takes effort, and takes mm -hmm. dollars. But they have been known to have, we've had frameworks where if you can pinpoint certain diseases or certain medical challenges, which within the available medical ecosystem today, governed by policymakers and private sectors, mm -hmm. if such medical challenges from the gender perspective can be, as a red flag, made available to every country, public and private partner, I think that this amalgam of some of the best minds mm -hmm. can help. I really like that idea because it's like what, she's, what Minister Rani says, like what are the best buys that exist today that countries can implement, right? We can do that, yeah. For instance, mm -hmm. and I'll take from what Ms. Zaidi said about the plastic sheet. Yes. We all know data exists today where most of the deaths are happening at childbirth due to excessive bleeding. Yeah. We are a country when there was pandemic, global supply chains had shut down, when there was no movement of goods, services, machines, we built the Indian PPE suit industry. Mm -hmm. In March, when the pandemic hit, we had zero companies. By May, we had 1,100 companies. Mm -hmm. By June, we became the second largest exporters of PPE suits in the world. 80% of those who were manufacturing were women. Your Excellency, I want to move to uh, Burnley because we're on TV. We have to stick to time. Mm -hmm. um, what role do you see uh, a company like yours playing in bridging this uh, data gap? And AI is coming into the equation now. So I think the big opportunity mm -hmm. of AI in this context is yeah, that when we again switch from the topic of the, let's say, the established healthcare systems to the emerging. To, to emerging healthcare systems, the discussion in the established healthcare systems is AI is a productivity tool. Yeah, how can I make the physician more efficient mm -hmm. and so on? How can I solve the staff shortage uh, problem? In this challenge, AI, it's about AI first. Yeah? So like instead of digitalization, there was digital first approaches. 
And instead of AIification of existing topics, it's about using AI to bring access to care. Yeah? So and this is, we have one example yeah, where we bring together with the Global Fund um, AI-based screening of tuberculosis uh, to Indonesia. Yeah? So this is about bringing diagnosis where it wouldn't have been without it. Let's continue the discussion uh, outside. We run out of time. Your Excellency uh, Smirti uh, Zubin Irani, Minister of Women and Child Development in India. Thank you very much. Anita Zaidi, President of Gender Equality at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you so much. Bernd Muntag, the Chief Executive Officer at Siemens Health and Ease. Perfa, the President of Faring Pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.